Okay, Paul, I am going to go ahead and um, make you the presenter while I give an introduction here. Okay. Oh, Got to stop my timer here. We would like to welcome our next speaker, Paul Mullinex. Uh, Paul has a wide range of experience including 15 years in the semiconductor industries. He has served various roles like um, senior sta staff statistician, director of quality and reliability, and director of customer service. He has spent 11 years in international statistical consulting based in Malaysia, and most re recently um, over seven years as director of global statistics and Six Sigma for Integris. Uh, supplying materials into the semiconductor industrial and life sciences markets. Before he joined industry, he was an assistant professor of, of statistics and mathematics at the University of North Florida for several years. So we would like to welcome Paul to our uh, 2022 DOE Summit. Take it away. Thank you very much, Sherry. And just a little confirmation, are you able to hear all right? Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you today, and especially following that very interesting talk by Mark there. Um, what I'm gonna do today is to tell you a real life story that actually happened. And Sherry mentioned I used to be a director of quality in, in Malaysia. And for all of you who might be in quality, let me just tell you a quick little fact there. When I first went to Malaysia, it was 1996. I ended up living there for 18 years and I had a beard and my beard was brown. And after one year of being in quality, that beard turned white. And it was for things like, like this. Now it happened to be cracked dye in that case in the semiconductor, but the one I'm gonna tell you now is about a product that goes into the semiconductor industry. Again, it's another crack issue. And we're gonna see two really interesting things about this. Number one, uh, as, as Mark mentioned, you know, he had temperature in his uh, ex ex experiments there. We're gonna have one factor that's gonna be temperature here. It's gonna be hard to vary. And so we're gonna use a split plot design to help us make this more practical. The second interesting thing is, we need to set a process window at the end on some factors that we know are critical. And how do we go about doing that? So that's what I'd like to kind of focus on. Now you're gonna see a picture up in the upper right-hand corner here. And this one has some special significance to me and I'm gonna explain this picture at the very end. All right, so just a little bit on what we're gonna do, we're gonna start with some information on what is the problem at hand, give you a little bit of background on that. Then I'm gonna not jump immediately into a DOE. This is a real life problem. So we didn't just say, okay, let, let's go to a, a, a DOE. Instead, we're gonna analyze the data that we have at hand. It'll help us understand the problem better we might get some clues using data mining into what factors are really going to be the key ones in my DOE so that I can shorten that process. And then because this is a real life issue, we had a, a problem that the customer might go line down. So we needed to put some interim containment actions in, which as it turns out, was another good way to get some clues into what factors might really be the ones that are driving this. And then we had one really huge problem. We could not measure this in the factory. 
So we needed to come up with a measurement system. All right, now, once we go through that, then I'm gonna take you through really a two-step process. First of all, we're gonna screen. We're gonna try to figure out what factors might be the really important ones that we might wanna use to set the process windows. And we're gonna use Design Expert for this. It has a great facility for designing a split plot. And since we're screening, we just wanna see main effects and two-factor interactions, so we'll make sure it can fit that model. And then we're gonna to get to setting statistically based process windows here. For that, we're gonna need a quadratic model so that we can kind of understand where things switch from being in a good region to maybe some kind of degraded region. All right, so let me start with the problem here. Okay, the problem was we had a crack in a wafer carrier. And you can see over on the right, we have these disks. These are wafers in which we will build up integrated circuits and later we'll saw them up into dye and put them into packages and they'll go into your hand phone or your car, for instance. Well, we have a carrier here. Now this is not the actual carrier that we used uh, for reasons of confidentiality, but our product had, actually it was a complete box and it was even enclosed, it had a front door. But this is a, way to carry these wafers. Now, unfortunately, we've given this customer a similar problem two years ago. And when they have a crack problem in, in the line, so when this plastic carrier becomes cracked, well, there are particles that can be released. Those particles can end up on top of the die, so we have to do cleanings. Also, it has an issue for the structural integrity of the uh, carrier, and if, if that should collapse, then of course you've got many, many broken wafers and, and probably hundreds of thousands of, of dollars there. All right, so we can have these kinds of issues. So we need to make sure that my customer doesn't lose revenue from this. And due to the fact that we've given them two problems now in two years, the customer is very sensitive. So we need a solution that's going to be something we can do quickly. Now, as with many problems, uh, you probably have an idea about a short-term and a long-term fix. Well, here, this is a mature product, and we've known about this for a long time. That, yeah, that if we could change the resin material, we could produce a better product. But to do that change, we'd need a new design, and this is gonna be an, a long-term solution. We need something that we can use right now. And of course, the big problem is that we can't detect cracks until they're used for some time in the wafer fab. And that's a big problem for us if we're gonna run DOE. So, so we're gonna have to solve that problem as well. All right, now before we try to use design of experiments here, we're not gonna jump immediately into that. Instead, let's take a look at the available data that we have. So one of the first things you might do is we might use maybe our production charts. And here we can see kind of for different lots what the variation was on this particular dimension and whether it was in or out of spec. And we can kind of see which lots may have had some problem. And we can kind of try to correlate these maybe with per the uh, lots that were a, a problem at the customer side. We also had SPC charts that we could use on critical input parameters, not just looking at output dimensions. And we used data mining here to kind of get a short list of which factors are really going to be associated with cracking. All right, now there's many things that you might do in data mining. Since I have a problem at the customer and it's, it's either cracked or not cracked, well, my response is gonna be discrete. But I have all kinds of mold parameters that could be continuous, so Maybe we would be looking at things like logistic regression, trying to get a handle on this. And one benefit, if we can get a handle using data mining, one benefit is that we might learn some important factors that might shorten our work in DOE. So if I know the right list of factors, I can kind of shorten part of that screening cycle. All right, now I, I mentioned we had a, an issue where the customer might go line down. Of course, we don't want that to happen. 
So we used a technique called recursive partitioning. And it, it asks a very simple question. If I have good product and I have crack product, you'll notice there's two colors for the cracks because we had either a top crack or a side crack that was of interest. I, I, I can ask a very simple question. Which factor, if I split it at some level, would produce bars on one side that were basically all in the good category and bars on the other side that were basically all in the crack category. In other words, they would discriminate between the good and the crack product the best. Well, for reason of, reasons of confidentiality, I can't tell you all the factor names, but we have one factor here that if we split it on that factor, and this is a mold parameter, well, it starts to produce um, discrimination here, but I may have to do this multiple times. So we can ask the same question again on each split. What's the next best factor that we could come up with that would split this? And you'll see we can continue this through several levels. And at the end, we get some bars here that are basically almost all green. And those are the ones that we might want to ship to the customer. All right, now we're, we're in an issue where the customer might go lying down, we have to ship product. And so we're gonna take the new lots that we produced based upon this training data and look at these different buckets that these fall in. And if we find some of our new lots fall in these buckets of the process variables that we're trying to split on here, then these might be good product to try and ship to the customer. All right, so that's one, one thing now. When we did this, of course, we're going to learn which factors might be good candidates to go into a DOE. So all this data mining actually is going to have benefits down the road here. We also did some reliability mo modeling here so that we could show that this was actually an infant mortality issue. So you'll see the shape parameter here being less than one. And what that tells us is that if we ship product to them and initially it looks good, we should get an early signal if anything is bad because the longer it goes, probably the better off we're gonna be. All right, now the big problem for us, we had to develop a way to detect cracking inside the factory. So we tried drop tests, we tried vibration tests, we just couldn't find anything that would really correlate with what was going on at the customer side. And so instead, we went to a destructive chemical test. We actually poured a chemical on the product. And if you pour enough of it on there, it's, it's gonna crack it for, for sure. So we also looked at the time to cracking. But with that, we could actually find a test that had really good correlation between those lots that we knew were bad and had cracking problems in the field and those that were actually good and did not have any cracking problems. So we had to validate this. So again, we did have some known bad lots and some known good lots. And so we looked for a low false positive and a low false negative rate. So that was one of the first things. This is just kind of good general advice before you jump into a DOE, you might want to make sure you have a really good measurement system before you waste a lot of time and money. All right, so let's take a look at our two-step process here. So the first thing I'm going to do is to try to find process drivers. All right, so we're going to run a screening design. Now, in this particular case, we're going to use five factors. Now, these are five factors that based upon the data mining, we think might be important factors. There was actually a sixth factor, and we knew that one was gonna be important, so there was really no need to put it into a screening design at, at this point if I'm just trying to figure out the big factors. Now, it's no secret if you're talking about a mold process, you're gonna have a at least one temperature and, and, and several, in fact. Well, one of our factors was gonna be a temperature. And that was gonna be a hard to vary factor because it's gonna require some time to stabilize. It's gonna make, you know, we have to make initialization shots through the mold here and, and all of that's gonna eat up production time. So if I ran an experiment, let's say an eight run experiment, and I completely randomize that factor, I might have five or six different changes of that mold temperature. 
And as Mark was really, you know, nice to point out, you can't just, just because two runs have the same high setting of mold temperature, you just can't run them repeatedly. You really need to uh, take it off of that, then reinitialize it to make it an independent run. And so we need to completely, if we want to completely randomize that factor, we're going to have several changes of mold temperature, and it's just going to be really costly to run that in production because we have to use production time for this. So instead, we're going to design a split plot design recommended by design expert here going to support a two-factor interaction model because in a mold process, it would be very common to have interactions. And since the experiment is going to be run over two days, we're going to block out the day-to-day -day variation. We're going to have a design recommended by design expert that's going to do all of that. All right, now before we jump into that, uh, let me give you kind of an idea if you've not used a split plot experiment before. Now this really, the name comes from agriculture where it was first used. And the, one of the debts that statistics has is to agriculture. And so if we looked at applying, let's say a fertilizer, well, you don't go out and apply the fertilizer by hand. Instead, you probably have a crop duster come over and do it from the air. And so you're gonna really need to apply that fertilizer to the entire field. Now, if I wanted to look at, let's say a seed variety, and that I can plant manually in smaller plots. So let's take a picture here. I'm gonna choose a field and I'm gonna subdivide it into these subplots here, which I can manually put two different seed varieties in. But when I apply the fertilizer, it's gonna to be to the entire field. All right, so having done that to field one and you know, randomly, I, I would choose which fertilizer I'm, I'm going to go first. Let's say it was fertilizer one. We would apply that to field one. And then I would have to apply fertilizer two to an entirely different field that, again, has been randomly split into different subplots and which I'm going to randomly put the seed varieties in. Now, that looks like you know, all we need, we've run fertilizer one and two here at its two levels. I have the seed varieties in each case. The problem is I wouldn't be able to test the fertilizer effect. That's, that's the effect that's being applied to the whole field. So you'll notice it's called the whole plot factor. And the seed variety, of course, is being applied to these subplots. So it's literally called the subplot factor. That's where those names come from. But because I'm gonna have trouble analyzing this correctly, what I'm gonna to have to do is replicate this design. So I'm gonna to have to come back and take an, another field. And let's say, you know, the next one, I would randomly choose which one uh, gets fertilizer one and, and, and fertilizer two. And I would have fields three and fields four that I would apply again, fertilizer one, fertilizer two to the whole field. And now I have two replicates of this experiment. Now it turns out that these fields represent our groups that you're going to see in Design Expert. And we have two replicates here that we're going to use. And it's and we have to be a little careful when we do the analysis because fertilizer is applied to an entire field, but seed variety is applied to a smaller subset. So the experimental units are actually different here, field for fertilizer and subplot for seed variety. So we need to be a little careful because we have restricted the randomization as well, that we get the right air term to do the testing. Now, all of this is taken care of seamlessly within Design Expert. You just tell it you wanna do a split plot, it'll handle all of those technical details. But what actually happens is, we're gonna end up using the replicate by fertilizer interaction term in order to test, get the right noise term here to test for the fertilizer effect. All right, now that's okay for agriculture, but it might be wondering, well, okay, how does that relate to what I'm gonna do in manufacturing? Because I'm not planting things, I don't have a crop duster here. All right, let's try and, and do what we did up above here in manufacturing. So in manufacturing, I have this temperature that's hard to vary. So that's gonna play the role of my fertilizer. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna 
toss a coin, and I'm gonna randomly pick which fertilizer goes first. Is it fertilizer one or is it fertilizer two? Then I'm gonna fix that fertilizer. So that, that's like having field one here. We've already got fertilizer one or temperature one that's going to apply to all of these at the same time. Then if I have other factors, let's say two other factors here, B and C, then I would randomize the order of B and C in a two squared design within this particular setting for temperature. And I would carry that out in random order. And then I would go to the next plot here, my whole plot, which is gonna be the other level of temperature. I would now fix that level of temperature. So that's like applying fertilizer two on the whole field. And then I would run my other factors in their experimental design within that setting for temperature. And that would be rep one. And then I would come back on the next day, again, toss a coin, decide which temperature goes first. Maybe this time it happens to be low. And I will do that one and then do all of the combinations of B and C within there and then go to the next level of temperature and do all the combinations of B and C. Now notice in that way, what we do, we make it practical for manufacturing because on each day, there's only one changeover of temperature. So I'll have that one changeover on day one and then I'll have that one changeover on day two. So it might look like you know, fertilizer seed varieties wouldn't apply, but actually we can put that into the, the setting of a, a, a real industrial DOE. All right. Now, to design this in Design Expert, we're gonna enter five factors. Again, these are the ones we think from the data mining should be the important ones. And you'll notice the hard to vary one is with the lowercase a, the rest, the easy to vary ones, the ones we can go down and just dial the settings in, we don't have to wait. Those are all gonna be with capital letters. We'll see the last one here is nominal. So, so this one is gonna be a categorical factor here. And so we have five that we're given from our data mining. Again, we have a sixth one that's known to be active, but we're not going to include it because we already know that's one we're gonna be working with. And we're gonna go into the response surface with five factors, and we're gonna to go to an optimal design. And I'm gonna, and this is a great procedure within Design Expert, it's very simple. Uh, I'm gonna ask it, in fact, most of, most of it, I'm just gonna accept the defaults here. It can use either its point exchange or coordinate exchange, so we'll let it take its pick here. I'll just leave it at the default for I optimality, which makes the, we, we should have a low prediction error across the uh, design space. <clears throat> I do wanna set it to be a two factor interaction model because the lower order model I, I can have, the smaller number of runs, we need to do this quickly. But of course I do need to take into account, I could have interactions. So I, I do wanna make sure I can cover that and I wanna block it. So this has got to be over two days, and I know I'm, I've got big day-to-day -day variation in that mold process, so I want to remove that from the analysis. All right, now I'll accept the defaults for the number of groups here and some additional points, and so I end up with 23 runs. And we can check that to make sure that it's going to have good properties. So if you click on the evaluation button in Design Expert, you can see what the power is going to be. And this is a little, can be a little mis misleading because everything is in the model. So these powers are actually going to be probably higher than they show here because we can, not everything is gonna be active. And you know, in Design Expert, you can actually take things out of the model and do some what-if scenarios and kind of see how those would change. The big story though for a split plot is that you, you will expect the power for the whole plot factor to be much lower. Again, it's gonna be bumped up some because we'll have not everything being active, but that, that will be somewhat lower. All right, so we have our experimental design right here. And now we used multiple responses here. I'm just gonna show one, the fraction of the level one and two uh, different types of, of cracks that, that we have, so all combined. 
So you can see those fraction of cracks that we have at each of these levels or each of these combinations of our, our factors here. And now we need to analyze this. Now, when you're analyzing a DOE, I usually tell people there are five things you wanna look for to accept a conclusion from data. And this would apply not only to DOE, but t-tests, analysis of variance, you know, chi-score tests, whatever. But there's generally five things you would want in order to accept a conclusion from data. And one is your data have to be stable. Now, why stable? Well, if in fact, uh, what I'm gonna ask for, if I don't see it, maybe I'll look at a control chart. Uh, you can look at the diagnostic plots within Design Expert, and they're gonna show you residual versus predicted charts or run charts that are gonna show you really whether things are trending up, down, whether they have outliers, and all of that's gonna be marked. Now, why am I concerned about stability? Because if I'm looking at a DOE or anything to do with analysis of variance, and, and that would include regression, any of those techniques are gonna be based upon averages. In fact, in DOE, we define a main effect for a two-level experiment is my average response value when my factor's set high minus the average response value when my factor's set low. So average high minus average low. And interactions, just linear combinations of averages. So stability is something important because averages can be affected by outliers. So I need to make sure that doesn't happen so I make the right decisions. Then I'm gonna make sure that what I'm looking at is real. It's not just noise. And you can use a normal probability plot for the effect estimates, or you could use p-values. And that's the, this is the one question that statistics is surprisingly good at answering. You know, what is real and what is noise? Are you looking at something that's probably a real effect or could this just be noise? So I need to see that p-value, for instance. And that tells me statistical significance, but then I have to make a judgment. Is that really practically important? And that's not a question for the software. That's a question for the subject matter expert here. Next, I need to be able to explain to somebody why this result is true. Because, I mean, if you've ever heard anybody say, well, I, I don't under understand it, but that's what the data say. Well, you can expect to get a lot of questions. All right, and this was brought home to me many years ago. I was in the, I was actually in the parking lot ready to go home. And an engineer I had taught DOE to, I was at the client's uh, place of business and he was in the parking lot and he stopped me and he said, we're having a problem with our DOE. And here was his problem. He had a mold process, kind of like what we're talking about here. And the theory was, when you shorten the transfer time, in other words, you push the mole compound faster, th then it's moving faster over the top of the die and has these little tiny gold wires on top. Well, that mole compound can push those wires over, they contact each other, short out the device, and they call that wire sweep. And the theory is the shorter the transfer time, the faster it's moving, the more wire sweep. Well, he, he, he said, uh, we're finding the opposite. The longer the transfer time, the slower we push it, the more wire sweep. Now, did he have data that was stable? Yeah. Was this result statistically significant? Yep. Was it important? You better believe it. But he did not have a theory why that is true. So we're always at risk in that case. But he was a really nice guy because the next day I'm still at that company. And he looked me up during a break and he said, last night we called the mole compound supplier. And the supplier said, that compound has a high gelling factor. Now we can explain this. The longer the transfer time, the slower we're pushing it, the compound's actually starting to cure. And it's starting to get harder. And that's what's pushing the wires over. Now we can explain it to somebody. So you always need to be able to explain it. And then finally, we need to have an equitable sample. We need to have the data collected fairly, no confounding. And of course, part of this is gonna be handled by our experimental design. 
and the other part's going to be handled by randomization so that even factors we don't even know about are not going to be confound or we won't have a high probability of being confounded with the factors in our DOE. All right, now these are great questions for managers to ask. So if somebody's giving you some conclusion from data that doesn't quite smell right, well, you might try to ask some of these questions. And if you want an easier way to remember it, I call it the wiser criteria. So why is it true? Has to be important, has to be an equitable sample and you know, fairly collected sample, and it has to be something that's real, it's not noise. All right, so we're gonna use that when we go to Design Expert. We're gonna need to ask a question here, collect the data, do the analysis. And of course, for DOE, we're testing whether a factor is active or not. The next part of this is, and fortunately, the next two steps are really the computer's responsibility. It's gonna calculate a test statistic, and it's gonna give me back a p-value. And it, the only way we can be sure the p-value is correct is if the assumptions were there in order for us to do the right calculation. And that's why we check all the diagnostics so we can trust those p-values. And then finally, I'm gonna look at those p-values, come back in, apply my five conditions, and we're gonna make our own conclusion. All right, so if I follow that here, from our first DOE for screening, these five factors, it looks like, and this is from a, a uh, We've actually done the reduced model here. We see there are two interactions that are really important. And E is our categorical factor. We have an interaction between that and the factor C, and an interaction between the whole plot factor A, that's our temperature, and factor B. Now, due to this being hierarchical, A, B, C, and E, all the main effects here are already included in the model to make it hierarchical. Since they're already in these interactions, I really just need to interpret these interactions. So I'm gonna use analysis of variance to confirm statistical significance with those p-values. Secondly, I'm gonna have to trust those p-values, so I wanna go to the diagnostics. I wanna make sure that my data is roughly normal. I don't see any outliers here. Uh, Cook's distance, we don't have any high leverage points in this case. And as Mark was saying on this plot with the box Cox plot here, looks like uh, everything's good. I'm within those limits. So I, I don't need any other transformation here. And to see if something is practically significant, I'm probably gonna go to something like the contour plots. I can look at these contour levels. I can see, also see this on an interaction plot or a main effect plot. But here I'm looking at these values and 0 0.2, 0 0.15, 0 0.1, I'd like that to be a lot lower if I'm going to try to reduce cracking, but this is only screening. I could use the optimizer here and it does help me to understand that my factor E, which is categorical, should be set at its high level. And again, I'm gonna to try to fix my categorical factors as soon as possible, then I can experiment more with the continuous factors. All right, so in this case, if we cut to the end of this, you know, what is our decision here? I always tell people when you're analyzing a DOE, there are two questions you need to answer. Number one, what did you learn from that DOE? And number two, what action are you going to take? And what we learned here, we have two interactions, an A, B, and a C, E interaction. We checked outliers, everything looked good. P-values were significant. This is important, judging from the contour plot. We have some theory, let's say, to understand why this is true. And because of the way we collected the data and the experimental design, we can be assured that this is a fair way to collect that data. All right, so the actions that we're gonna take, we're clearly gonna fix E at it's high level, that's the categorical factor. And we also ended up fixing factor C at its high level. And that left, because that one is something we didn't have too much room to vary on, but that also left two factors A and B. And we mentioned there was another factor that we're gonna add in because we know it's an important factor. So I'm just gonna call that my new factor C. And now the idea is to fit that quadratic model so that we can see my process windows for factors A, B, and C. All right, so we've done the screening. 
Now we're ready to set statistically based process windows. All right, now, maybe this is from my background as a statistician. I'm gonna write a few Greek symbols up here, if you'll pardon me. But what you're gonna notice here is that, is that I'm trying to move something off my screen. There we go. What, you, what I'm doing is writing a response surface model in two factors, A and B. So Y is my response. The betas here are the coefficients in the model. I've got main effect terms for A and B here, an interaction term, and squared terms. Then I also have an error term. Now, the, the only reason I'm writing this here, I want you to observe something about this. If I were to take the average of both sides, and no self-respecting statistician would write average here, we usually write expected value, but don't let the statisticians get away with that. We're just taking an average. So if I took the average of both sides, well, all of these terms in the model, all these terms with betas here, they're all constants. And I get to set the value I want for A and B. But the error term, that's a random variable. And if I take the average of the errors, we assume that that's going to be zero. Now, once you fit the model in Design Expert, it's going to actually plug in numbers for these coefficients. So I'm going to write those as the small b's here. And that's going to be the model I'm going to use to make a prediction. So I'm going to illustrate that by using a little hat over the y for the predicted value for y. Now, if you look at the previous line here and this new line, you'll see formally they look the same on the right-hand side, which means when you make a prediction, you are actually making a prediction for the average response. In other words, you're never gonna model defects. You're gonna model average defects. And so that's what we're looking at here. This is a model for the average. Now, when I do a contour plot, as you can see at the base of this surface plot, or actually look at the surface plot, that is the plot for my predicted value. I mean, that's the actual model being plotted. And so this is what the average response is going to look like. This is my average rate of cracking. All right, so a statistical model is always going to be a model for the average. Now, the points that are going to be there are actually going to vary above or below that model surface. And so that means when I'm looking at this contour plot, this is a plot on the average. But what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to set process windows. And this is going to be a spec on individual values, not on an average. So I need a way to take this contour plot for an average and convert it into something that relates to individuals. And how I'm going to do that, I'm going to suppose that the points that vary above and below this surface, let's say, follow some normal distribution, just as, as an assumption. And then I'm going to calculate the standard deviation from my model, and we'll see how to get that right out of Design Expert. And then I'm going to create some new variables. I'm going to take my response. I'm going to add plus minus k standard deviation. So I'm actually going to go up a certain distance above that surface and a certain distance below that surface. And then I'm going to analyze those variables. And the model will be exactly the same except for the constant term. That will be different whether I raised or lowered it. And then I'm going to do an overlaid contour plot. And I'm going to see if there's any region where the overlaid contour plot would satisfy the, the specs I want on my response. And if there is, then I'm going to try to draw the largest rectangle I can in that region and use that to set my process windows for factors A and B. OK, so let's see how that's going to actually work here. So I'm going to take my second DOE. I have my factors A and B that I screened. I'm going to add this new factor C that we know is going to be active. And this happens to be categorical. I'm going to fit a response surface model 
for factors A, B, and C. So that'll be some function related to my output Y, which is gonna be the fraction that, that cracked. And I'm gonna get a standard deviation around that model. And I'm gonna use that to create a response plus minus K sigma. And everything is gonna be the same in these models except the constant term. We'll just raise or lower that surface. Now you could just take values from a normal distribution like uh, you know, three, two, and plug those in for plus minus three sigma, plus minus two sigma. Or if you wanted to get a little fancier, you could actually use tolerance limit values. I'm just gonna plug in three and two here. And in this particular problem, it uh, turns out three sigma limits did not show me any feasible region on the overlaid contour plot. So we'll need to kind of back off if necessary. And here we actually ended up with using 1.645. Now, if you had two-sided specs, that would give you 90% coverage. But with a one-sided spec that we have, we just need it to be, you know, the percentage crack below some level. That's going to give me a 95% limit that I can apply. So I'm going to fix C at its optimal value after that first DOE, and I'm going to produce an overlaid contour plot for Y plus minus K sigma. And then I'm going to draw the largest rectangle I can to give me my process windows. Okay, so let's take that second DOE. Again, I'll go back to Design Expert. It's got a great facility to do this. I'm going to go to the response surface here. Under split plot, you will find optimal. And I'm going to use that. I have two numeric factors. I have one categorical. Of course, one of my numeric factors is a mold temperature. So that'll be my hard to vary factor. Then in the optimal design, again, we'll just take mostly the defaults. But this time, I do want to make sure I have a quadratic model because I need to see where the process starts to degrade. So I know how far out we can go and still be in good shape. So this also means I have to be a little careful when I design this, that I go maybe wider than I normally would on the factor levels so that I'm sure I've got a region where, yes, this is going to degrade. Now, I don't want to you know, see zero yield or anything, but I do need to see the difference between the good regions and the bad regions so I know kind of where to draw that line. Now, this one we could run all at, at one time, only 14 runs. And we see the experimental design right here. Again, this is a split plot design. I've got a hard to vary factor. And when we analyze that, again, what I'm looking at, we see a B squared term that's highly significant. I've got an AC interaction. Now that's very marginal, uh, but if I don't wanna miss anything, I might go ahead and just look at it. I've got an AB interaction here that's highly significant. So I've gone ahead and fit the reduced model just to save a little time. In the second step, under the analysis of variance in Design Expert, you'll see the fit statistics here. I'm going to get that standard deviation. So I found the standard deviation that I'm going to need. Then I'll go to the solutions. I know where to set factor C. I'm going to set it at its high level. That's the categorical factor. And now I'm going to create some new responses here. So I have the fraction cracked here as response one. Then I'm going to add and subtract. And I'll save a little time. I would try three sigma first, then two sigma. If I don't find anything that has a, a feasible region on the overlaid contour plot, I'll have to back off a little more. So I backed off to plus minus 1.645 sigma. Created those new responses. And now I'm going to go ahead, analyze those new responses, and construct the overlaid contour plot. So this is that overlaid contour plot, but it has a bit of a problem. This is the plot for the, or sorry, this is the, not the overlaid, excuse me. This is the original one for factor one. And this one has a bit of a problem because when I only analyzed, should have said response one here, when I only analyzed response one, we see the contour plot is for the average response. And yeah, there is a zero on here. Now you might be wondering, 
wait a minute, can this model go below zero? Because the fraction that are cracked here cannot go below zero. Now that's true, practically. But I'm fitting a statistical model and there's nothing in that model that says it can't go negative. So I want things that are at zero or even below here. I'm assuming that ought to be even better. And so, or at least as good here. So I'm gonna be looking at this region, but this is for the average response. What I need is to use the overlaid contour plot, and that's what you're looking at here. When I do the overlaid contour plot on the fraction cracked plus minus 1.645 sigma, we see the feasible region, and this is on more than just that one factor, so there's actually several responses here, and we see that the feasible region is right in this yellow. Once I see that, and because I've increased or decreased things by plus minus k sigma, I know this is going to apply to the individual data points. And so I'm going to fit the largest rectangle that I can within that region, and then I can read off using the crosshairs within Design Expert, I can read off what those limits are going to be. And once I know those limits, that's going to be my process window for my factor, my continuous factors A and B here. So with this, I get a one-sided constraint. So I can say at 95% chance that if I'm operating within this window, then all of the units coming out should be good. 95% of those units should be good. I'd like to have 100%, but at least this gives us a place to start. All right. So that final picture, the first picture on that very first slide here, let's take a look. This is the contour plot for the average. This first window that you're looking at is actually the original process window that we were using when we had the crack issue. So there could be variation in resin batches, for instance, that was going to push me over the edge, and that's probably what happened here. Notice this isn't even entirely within the range that we were experimenting with in the DOE. Now, when they went to their containment, they chose, and this was largely by engineering judgment, but some of the data mining here, they chose this region. And you'll still see, although it's better, there is part of that region I'm still going to have some problems. I need to get down here, and this is for the average, so I need to adjust this using the overlaid contour plot for my process window for the individual values, and this is going to be my statistically based process window, and this should be zero at least for 95% of the individual units. That's at least what we would predict from this. All right, now some key takeaways. Don't just jump into a DOE. Uh, first, make sure you've got good measurement systems. Use data mining to get some clues for factors in a DOE. Now, obviously, if you're in an R&D application, you may not have previous data. But if you're in manufacturing, why not take advantage of that? Second, I'm going to use DOE to help me determine my process drivers here. And DOE can expose interactions. And as Mark was saying, you know, this is a great advantage over one factor at a time experimentation. And for a mold operation, interactions are very, very common. And I'm going to use DOE whenever I suspect I have interactions or my problem's a little more complicated. I'm going to use experimental design that's appropriate for the type of data. In this case, I had a hard to vary factor, so I'm going to be using a split plot design, and that's particularly easy to design within Design Expert. I'm going to remember when I draw a conclusion, there are five conditions I probably ought to check. Are my data stable? Is the result real? Do I have that p value I can look at? Is it important from a practical point of view? Can I explain why it's true? Do I have a theory that would account for it? And do I have an equitable sample? Were my data collected fairly? Then I'm gonna ask two questions from any DOE. What did you learn and what action are you gonna take? I should at least be able to answer those questions. 
And finally, for the case at hand, we see how using two factors here with Design Expert to produce this overlaid contour plot can help us to set statistically based process windows. Now remember, specs are usually set on individuals, not on the average. So just be aware that contour plot you're looking at is a plot for the average. All right, I think that's it. Um, any, any questions? Thanks so much, Paul. Um, let's see, looking at questions here. Um, we have a question. Did you account for the variation or variance of your input settings? Um, any chance that you performed like a Monte Carlo simulation to determine the impact of the input variance on the output? Yeah, that's um, an interesting question. Uh, here we, we have parameters that we can actually go down and dial in. Now, of course, just because you dial it into a setting doesn't mean it's going to actually achieve that particular setting. So you do have to monitor the equipment to see what the actual setting was. Uh, from the, the, the experience of the mold engineers here, they did not see any real issue with uh, that because the, the mold process is being controlled by PID controllers. So we have pretty good control on those actual values. But that's a, a great point. Yep. Um, and speaking from my knowledge of design expert, I'll just point out that there is a propagation of error um, tool that can be used within design expert, um, but it, it still does require uh, some tool to assess the variation of those input factors. All right. Um, going back to that very uh, first uh, the starting point um, when you're talking about a screening design um, a couple people actually asked because um, they they were worried if if that sixth factor is not included um, how would you have would you lose the chance to see if that might interact with other factors or how do you deal with any concerns about that yeah, it's really kind of a trade-off between the amount of experimental material you have, the time you have available, and the size of the design that you're you're willing to to use here. So this was such a big factor, we knew it'd have a a, a big effect. So we did not in, in, include it. But that's always a, a a risk, is that yeah, there could be something else that would interact with it. Uh, from the experience of the mold in, in engineers, the, if, if it was something that interacted with it, it would probably be small, and so we're probably not missing anything. But some some expert knowledge would probably be necessary there. That that's another very good question. Okay, um, somebody asked uh, how you overlaid the plots, and um, I, I realize you don't probably don't have a design expert up and running, but I'll just point out that that is. Uh, the graphical optimization part of. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So yeah. So here I have. That. Yeah. So here I have the two responses over here, in response two and response three, and what I'm going to do is to move down to the uh, graphical analysis here, and. I'm going to make sure that uh, these have been analyzed and I'm going to go to the graphs and that's how we can it's so simple we just overlay these now I'm, I'm going to give my age away here because I can remember and when I do this overlay plot for any you know engineers that I happen to be training I always think back to when I was a young engineer and I had to go to a different building to get my printouts and they were in, you know, on a matrix printer, dot matrix printer. I'd bring them back to the copy machine. I would fiddle around with the zoom until I got the different plots to be about the same size. And then I'd make a transparency of each one and I would physically overlay these. And so people today don't realize what a great tool this actually is. And just a click of a button, you can actually see that overlaid contour plot right there. Mm -hmm. Yep, I did the same thing, Paul, back in the early days. Nowadays, many of these people <laughs> don't even know what a transparency is. Yeah. <laughs> that's, and, and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, as long as you're on the screen, uh, I was just curious, and, and Mark was curious too, if you had tried using the um, adding the tolerance intervals right on um, uh, uh, on, on the criteria um, page here, there is the option of adding tolerance intervals onto onto um, an overlay plot. Okay, so you may not have tried doing that, but. I have not tried to do that, but that sounds like an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Okay, let me check on questions here. Let's see, somebody is asking, um, is using the standard deviation an appropriate measure? Should you not use the prediction interval which is not constant throughout the design space to subtract from the mean to find the parameter window. Um, yeah, what I'm really trying to do is just to get a measure of how far these points are gonna vary above and below that surface. Mm -hmm. And so just assuming that it's roughly normally distributed, I'm, I'm just gonna do something kind of quick there. But I think your other idea about using the tolerance interval would actually include some more variation in there. Yeah, so as long as you're on the screen, Paul, um, just click on that criteria button and um, go to your fraction cracked, that first one. Oh, is this, is this graphical? Um, okay, I think what we'd have to do is enter some limits first. Um, okay. A lower upper limit, then the option probably comes comes up. Like perhaps because you want to minimize it, perhaps put in an upper limit of like, you know, 0 0.08 or something like that. Click okay. and enter. Um, okay, I'm not seeing that. Usually, right underneath the word analysis, um, there would be an option to add in. So I'm not sure why it's not there. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. So we won't worry about it that. But usually, um, there would be the option right on here to add in those intervals, and that would meet what Niles is is asking for it would it would do all the calculations at every point in the design space okay um, okay i am looking for any okay oh okay any tips for using statistical based process windows when dealing with combined response optimization of multiple responses Alex just made that much more complicated by having multiple responses. Yeah, well, if you have multiple responses, then you've got to do an overlaid contour plot for each response and mm -hmm. see what the ultimate region is that, that you can operate. So you'll have to create this, you know, Y plus minus K sigma for each, each response and then analyze all of those. Mm -hmm. And it even gets a little more complicated if you have more than two factors you would have to produce, let's say you had a third factor. You'd have to go to the low and high setting of the third factor, produce this plot separately, and then, then compare those. So it, it gets a lot more complicated if you have even more than two factors. So probably it's best to stick with just two factors for this method. Yeah, um, using some of the extra tools within Design Expert, you can add tolerance intervals into the numerical optimization as well as the graphical optimization. So there are tools there. Um, okay. But it does get complex to think about. 